because I have to distinguish between the objective and the subjective aspects of reality. And I said there is a two-way connection between them. But, but actually, uh, uh, that's not enough because, because there is sometimes a, a connection just on the subjective level. So when you, when I say to you, you are my enemy, right? It has an effect on your, on your thinking about me, and you may well become my enemy because I said you are my enemy. So it may be a true statement, but it may not be based on knowledge because it's not knowledge you created an enemy when you said so. So uh, I got really caught up in this, and, and in fact, uh, I, I, I uh, uh, mentioned that there was a time when I was writing on the subject, and I couldn't, the uh, next day when I tried to read what I'd written, I couldn't understand what I was saying. I mean, that's the nature of <coughs> philosophy. So I kind of skirt the issue in, in, in this book, you know, and, and sort of step, because if you want to describe it, you get into these difficulties, and they lead to interminable disputes. You need more But you need more it's all, this is all, all the mess, all the misunderstanding is in, ver, in the world tree. I, I do have a, uh, I, I did want to ask a, a, okay. a, a separate thing, and it, it really uh, concerns the relationship between, um, I guess, freedom and the economy. And uh, let, let, let me preface it, the populist um, criticized Marx um, for, for what he called economism, which was basically the idea that um, all human values and solutions to problems, social problems are, can be reducible to economic terms. And um, you know, this was the basis of his criticism. And um, apropos to the question about Hayek earlier, it's interesting because uh, I've often thought of, if Marx was economism on the left, Hayek was sort of economism on the right. And, and, and this is very interesting because uh, there, in, in one of his books, I guess it was his last book, um, Hayek says, uh, acknowledges, you know, summing up his whole philosophy, he says that um, I'd have to uh, say that if it was possible, if, 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 if a socialist, if a centrally planned system was shown to be more efficient and uh, more productive than a, um, than a free market, then I would have to opt for the centrally planned system, despite the fact that he thought that it would entail totalitarianism. But Popper took the opposite view, and he said he personally thought that the market would always be more efficient and productive, but he might be wrong, but he thought that he would still support the market because of the tendency of, of, of a centrally planned market to lead to totalitarianism. And I, I'm thinking that when I was uh, conducting all those workshops for you uh, in Eastern Central Europe, one of the things that disturbed me was that I, I think that I felt that a lot of people who were open and perhaps enthusiastic about open society, because they thought that it would inevitably lead to the promise of economic prosperity, and uh, and, and I thought that that was unfortunate because uh, it, it set up the classic uh, reaction or a movement towards closed society that Popper talked about. So I wanted you to you know, talk, and then you, you criticize the market fundamentalists. I think that that is a kind of economism on the right. Yeah. Um, I, I know Popper said we have to plan for both freedom and security, and economic security. Um, do we value freedom because of the economic? I mean, when, when push comes to shove, when you get down to the, the, the fundamental, you know, the last point, do we value freedom because of the economic prosperity that it promises? Do we value economic prosperity, free market, because of the social freedom that it affords, or how do you, how do you see it? Yeah, I, I see a um, kind of connection. I don't want to call it reflexive because it sounds like a reflexive, you know, was, everything was reflexive, and I, I don't want to over, overstretch the term, but there is a, a two-way connection. <coughs> Uh, uh, between prosperity and open society. Because, in my view, 
open society is a tough concept. It's a hard concept to live with because it means accepting uncertainty. It means accepting fallibility and so on. It's, 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 it creates, it, it, you live in a very complicated world. And if you could simplify it, it would be better. It would be easier. So it's a hard world to live in. It's a, it's a hard burden uh, to, to, to carry. And it's only justified, or it, it can carry itself, or it becomes sustainable when it produces positive results, uh, which come from uh, liberating the freedom and the exercise of freedom. And if that leads to uh, scientific uh, discoveries, uh, uh, artistic flowering, uh, 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 pros uh, uh, prosperity through the market economy, uh, then there is a feeling of well-being and, and optimism that, that uh, overcomes the, the <laughs> sort of the doom of not being able to actually get there. You, know, that you, see, you, you reach for it, but it seems to be always moving further away, namely the truth or the, you know, the, the ultimate uh, uh, nirvana, the perfection. You know, the, the fact that perfection is on the other. So, it's, it, so there is this connection that on the one hand, freedom does liberate and that does bring you this uh, a big lift, and and on the other hand, uh, uh, that big lift then makes it acceptable uh, to to live uh, in acceptable society. So there is, to me, a, 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 a this two-way uh, uh, connection between prosperity and the society. Well, we have a schedule, and we're trying to keep with the schedule. There's another meeting at 12:30 to get to. So maybe in the transition, those of you who have questions can catch George as we transit, uh, make the transition. Yeah. But uh, let, let me just uh, finish with a few comments, because uh, I, I think we're in a, a fairly good stop. Uh, one of the things that really impresses me about George's work is uh, an almost relentless uh, analysis that uh, he formulates one idea and tests it and formulates another idea. He's just constantly formulating analyses and asking questions. And when I compare that with what I do, I find that I sort of ask a question, formulate an answer, become comfortable with my answer, and go off to something else. And so I've asked myself, why is this why is there this difference between the way he operates and the way I operate? And perhaps it's personal history in part. But also I think he tests his ideas in practice. I may publish a paper or change my lecture notes, but he acts in the market. He writes books in an attempt to influence policy. So he gets feedback that's very real. And so in a sense he's almost compelled by circumstances to then analyze what worked and what didn't work. Now this more academic approach that I would say characterizes my work today may be fine for the Midwest, but in a city like Washington, I think we have an unusual opportunity to employ this more activist approach to inquiry. And so I would recommend you to reflect on that possibility. It might give us a certain distinction.